Thank you, folks. It was good. It was good. Thank you. Thank you, praise song. That was good. We're glad to see you tonight. If you'll find the Word of God, please, we're going to look at John chapter 8 and chapter 13 and chapter 15. Just selected verses there, not all of them. We should be through in at least three hours very easily. But tonight we're talking about the word disciple. It's probably one of the most important words in the Bible, and we don't use it like we should, nor pay enough attention to it. Or it's how Christ describes those who follow him as a disciple. Remember, remember in the Great Commission, just before the taxi clouds took Jesus back to heaven, he said to his people, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go you therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now it looks like the active verb in that sentence is go, but it isn't. The word go is a present participle in that sentence structure as well as baptized as a present participle. And uh, there's one, one verb there, and that verb is disciple. As, you, as you're going, says a participle, as you're baptizing, as you're making, as you're doing these things, going into all the world, disciple people. Make disciples of them. And so it's important to us to know what disciples are and what it means to be a disciple. Michelangelo once gave himself to a sculptor and said, I want to be your pupil. And the, the teacher said, if you do this, it will take your life. And Michelangelo said, what else is a life for? I think when we come to Jesus Christ, he understands and we need to understand that he expects us to be disciples. And when we do it, we'll take our life. And you and I can ask ourselves, what else is a life for other than being a disciple of Jesus Christ? 270 times in the New Testament this word is used for Christians. It is the same word as the word Christian. Remember in Acts 11 and verse 26, the scripture says it was at Antioch that disciples were first called Christians. And so we need to ask ourselves, what's involved in being a disciple? Well, we can begin by saying there, there are three aspects of being a disciple. There is faithfulness, there is that part of it, and there is fellowship, and we'll talk about what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is fruit. There is the faithfulness and the fellowship and the fruit. And each of this is a part of being a disciple, of being what the Bible says is a Christian. Disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, says the Scripture. So we're talking about what it means to be a Christian. First of all, there is being faithful. In John 8, 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. A disciple is someone who is faithful. Uh, this faithfulness is kind of like marriage. You know, it's pretty easy to get married. It is not easy to make the marriage work. Uh, you can get married pretty quickly. I've, I've done marriages in seven minutes. You know, you stand here, you stand here. Do you? I do. Do you? You do. And then you, you've done it. And kiss and leave. You know, you can do that. You can, you can get married pretty easy. And you can say, I believe in Jesus pretty easy. But the fact is that after you say, I believe, and after you make that commitment, you're to be faithful to it. You're to do those things that make it continue. And so those who hold to my teaching, says Jesus in John 8, 31, these are the people who really are my disciples. It's kind of like being a parent. Uh, you know, it takes more than biology to be a parent. Uh, there can be conception and, and pregnancy and birth, but that's not all there is to being a parent, just being a biological parent. I heard about a lady who was giving birth to her first child, and after all that great agony and pain as the child was born, she asked the nurse, is the hard part over? She said, no, honey, the hard part's just beginning. It's going to be hard for the next 18 years. It's kind of like that to become a Christian. You commit yourself to continuing with the commitment that you have made to follow through in that way. What does it mean to continue? What does it mean to hold fast to what it means to follow Christ? It means to learn and to live the Word of God. To learn and to live the Word of God. In Acts 2, it says that the people who believed the Lord 
had great fellowship and the other things they did and it said and they continued in the apostles teaching now what was the apostles teaching it was the life of Christ it was the words of Christ they were the apostles were first-hand witnesses of Christ that's what the word means and they were people who were sharing the life of Christ with these people who continued to learn and to live the life of Christ now all of us are influenced by something and the Bible says that Christians are influenced by what we listen to we are influenced by the word by the word about Christ by the word of Christ by the word of God we're to be influenced by this word and this word determines our lifestyle it determines the way we live it determines what we want to do what we like to do what we will do what we will continue in doing for the Lord we are influenced by the thing to which we listen and Christians listen to the word of God I have a friend some of you know named Paul Powell and Paul said that one day in his hometown of Tyler that he was driving with his windows up it's kind of a cold day he had the easy listening station on you know easy listening a young man pulled up next door to him who had his stereo turned on so loud in the car that it made the car vibrate and he said and I could hear his music over mine through both of our closed windows so I looked over at him so this young man was just jiving and going and jumping up and down and he said and there I was just calm and easy what was the difference it was what we were listening to I was listening to easy music so I was calm and easy he was all jittery because he was jangled up and listening to that kind of music you need to ask yourself what am I listening to I'm not talking about music here I'm talking about how you live what am I listening to what do, what influences me what helps me decide does the television help me decide how to live or does the Word of God do the people around me help me to learn how to live or are they the ones who show me am I listening to someone else or am I listening to the Word of God a disciple is someone who listens to the Word of God who learns and lives by the Word of God when I graduated from college back in the dark ages they still had baccalaureate even for state colleges and uh, and our preacher was a Presbyterian preacher one day he told us to watch out for the people that we would be associated with because we'd probably become like them if we weren't careful as we began our work in the world and uh, <clears throat> he told a story about st. Teresa coming down from heaven and she was to check on things in the United States and call st. Uh, uh, Peter in heaven and give a report each each week uh, she got to New York City she said hello st. Peter this is st. Teresa I'm making my report it's a little bit worse than we thought it was going to be I'll be in Dallas I'll call you there next week next week next Saturday from Dallas she called hello st. Peter this is st. Teresa a little bit worse here than I thought it was going to be I'll call you from Hollywood next week and she in the next week the phone didn't ring and the next week the phone didn't ring and on the third week the phone rang and Peter answered her. she said hello Peter darling this is Terry the people that you spend your time with may determine how you act John 8 31 says that you are my disciples if you continue in my teaching being a disciple of Jesus Christ means a fellowship it means holding hands with other people in John 13 34 and 35 Jesus said now this was rare he said I give you a new commandment that you love one another that you love each other just like I have loved you now you think about that how has God loved you he loved you when you were unlovely he loved you when you're unlovable uh, he accepted you when you're unacceptable he forgave us when our sins were unforgivable this is how we've been loved he said you're to love each other like that and this is how other people will know that you are my disciples and that you love one another so a part of being a disciple is being in fellowship is loving all the people in the family of God is loving people in the church we're to love each other this is how we let our light so shine that others may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven we love each other now that may not mean that we always agree with each other we can still love each other and not agree with each other it may mean we may not always like each other you can love somebody you don't like do you know that love is not a feeling it is a lie for you to believe that love is a feeling love is an action you can love people or hate people or ignore people and it doesn't have anything to do with how you feel it has to do with what you do and the word says that you will love people that you don't agree with you will love people that you don't even like you're to do good for each other you're to love each other and to be a part of that kind of fellowship a disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who loves everyone else in the fellowship and that means they do good for them they pray for them they help 
every way they possibly can. And not only that, but you're to love the whole world. You're to love everyone. Jesus said anybody can love his enemies. Anybody can love people who agree with them. But I want you to outlive and outlove the world around by showing love to all people. Now, this fellowship means there are no guerrillas in God's army. Uh, what I'm saying is there are no one-man armies. God doesn't send people out singly. He, he sends us out together. I remember they taught us in recon platoon when I was in service that you all go out together and you stay together and you come back together. And if you ever make yourself apart from the other group, you're in great big trouble. You go together, you stay together, you come back together, or you're in great danger. God says that same thing to his army, that we're people who operate in fellowship. We operate in union. We operate together. That's what it means to be a part of the fellowship. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another by this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love one for another. All right, now look at John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What does a disciple do? A disciple bears fruit. Now that fruit is what? It's evangelism. Some people might say, no, Pastor, the... the the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and goodness and meekness and kindness and tenderness. Well, that's true. But that's not the kind of fruit he's talking about here because we see later on in verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Now, you could go to a monastery and not go anywhere and, and have the fruit of the Spirit, the love and the joy and the peace, the long-suffering, the goodness and kindness and meekness. But the kind of fruit you go and get is other Christians. You go and share the love of Christ. Who else is going to do it if you don't? Who's going to let the world know about Jesus Christ if you don't? If you and I are not bearing fruit, how is the fruit going to be born? And, and our Lord says, you and I are a part of that. There are four factors in producing fruit. There has to be good seed. There has to be good soil. There has to be a good climate. And there has to be a sower. There's never been a crop produced unless there was somebody to sow the crop. Unless somebody does the planting, no matter how good the soil, how good the climate, how good the seed, there won't be a crop unless someone sows the seed. And God calls his disciples to be sowers of those seeds in every way that we can. And we're to, we're to sow the good seed about Jesus Christ that we really have. And that's what God is telling us we're to do as, as people who are, who are his people. Who are his disciples. I heard about some farmers on a rainy day were sitting around uh, the grocery store having an argument about whose religion was the best. And they were arguing about their churches and arguing about their religion and mine's better than yours and, and we're the only way and all of this kind of thing. And, and the older, wiser farmer in the group hadn't said a word. And finally they said to him, Jim, what do you think? Who do you think really has the true religion? Jim paused a moment and he said, uh, you know, over that hill is the gin where we take our cotton crops. Now, there's several ways to get there. If we went right straight to it, we'd have to go over this real steep hill, and it's, it's, a, it's not very far, but it's a, it's a terrible climb to get there. So if we went to the road to the right, it would be almost as short, but it's a very, very rough road. So if we went to the road to the left, he said that, that road would be nice and smooth, but a lot longer. And then he looked him in the eye and he said, but when we get there, the Jenner never asked us which way we came. He wants to know, how good is your cotton? Now, I think you and I need to understand that our judgment will not be our which way we came, whether the Methodist way or the Baptist way or the Presbyterian way. God wants to know, how good is your fruit? And what does that mean? Do you know of anyone who's ever become a Christian because of you? Do you know of anyone who's ever been inclined to come to the Lord Jesus Christ because of you? One man wrote, Oh, what regret will then be mine when I face my Lord divine if I've wasted all the talents he doth lend? If no one to me can say, Friend, I'm glad you came my way, for it was you who told me of the sinner's friend. The Lord says, I want you, I want you to bear fruit. And that fruit is, is other Christians. Every time a freshman uh, enrolls at Golden Gate, Golden Gate Seminary, they, they understand something. 
They understand that during the first semester there, they're to go out into that society where there are plenty of people to find and find someone who's not a Christian. And they're to win that person to Christ. And then they are to stay with that person and disciple that person until they win someone else to Christ. And we're simply trying to teach these Christian leaders and ministers that you're not having ministry until the people you're winning are winning others. God intends that we be people who bear fruit, that we be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that we are people who continue in following the Lord Christ, that we have fellowship with other Christians in the Lord Christ, and that we are people who bear fruit to his glory and to his honor. I guess when I think of the word disciple, I think most of all of the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or in Germany, they call him Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in the late 30s, making a lot of impact for Christ when Hitler began to take over. And all the Christians, a lot of his Christian friends, were fleeing Germany to get away from the lies and the power of Hitler. But Bonhoeffer said, no, I I will not run from his lies. I will not run from his power. For I won't have the right to come back and preach to the people if I don't go through the same thing they went through during this war. And so soon Bonhoeffer was locked up in a German concentration camp because he would not believe or would not say that Hitler was the savior. You know, when you say Heil Hitler, you're saying savior Hitler. And he kept saying, Jesus is my Fuhrer. The Lord is my Savior. And for that he was put in prison. He was eventually killed by Hitler. Bonhoeffer became one of the greatest examples to people about how to suffer as a Christian and how to keep his faith and how to show people how to live as Christ. It seemed that everyone was talking about how how well he lived and how confident he was and how strongly he won even the guards to Christ and what an impact he made in prison as he became a fruit bearer, even in that hard place, to the glory of Christ. His letters were smuggled out and they, they touched hundreds of people. He became a celebrity all over the land. And in one of his prefaces of his book, I read where he wrote, Who am I? Am I the person they say I am, strong and confident and unafraid and bold, or am I the person I feel like I am, afraid, imprisoned like a bird in a cage, waiting for life to be shut off? Who am I? And he closed that long discourse by saying, Who am I? I don't know. But whoever I am, O Lord, I'm yours what it means to be a disciple it gives it takes your life but then what else is a life for except to be a follower a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ let's bow in prayer shall we Lord thank you so much for these dear faithful people for this church in a church for these who are here because they love you and want to give more of their time to saying, I love you and I want to worship you. I want to learn your word and obey it. And, oh, Father, I I just pray you'll bless each one here. Lord, their lives are so vital. The influence in this room is almost incalculable. If we think about all the lives that the lives of these people touch, all these great young people will be dealing with young people tomorrow who will never want to come inside a church and They need to see Christ in them if they see him. I pray for Bible school, Lord, and all the great influence of that meeting and for what will happen in Vacation Bible School this week. Lord, I pray you'll bless the men in business, the women in business, those who who go to different ways and live in different circles and in their homes. I pray you'll bless them as they are disciples of yours. And Lord, may all of us, because we are yours, uh, be continuing in following after your will letting your word guide our lives. May we be in fellowship as we never would hurt or do anything to another fellow Christian or anyone else but help and love. And may we continue bearing fruit to the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name I ask it, amen. We want to invite you now to do whatever thing that God would have you to do. If that's a public decision of professing your faith or joining this church or rededicating your life or sharing a particular thing which God has laid on your heart, we'll be happy to meet you at the front as you do that. Let's stand now and you come and do God's will, would you?